Thank you for coming today. Uh, it's really glad to see you, everyone here. And uh, today's lecture is a little bit unique and different from those we've been doing for a long time before. Uh, today we're going to discuss some secrets regarding speaking and writing section of the IELTS. Uh, you will have uh, some unique and exclusive information on how to get the Bensco you deserve, the Bensco you want. So that's why please uh, put a lot of attention on this information. Uh, get ready some interesting questions. And here is a point at the end. Uh, the person who will give the most interesting question will get a special gift from the intonation. So that's why, please uh, be ready. And now we should start. Let's invite the guests of today. The first person is uh, Ms. Barno Mukimova. The next person is. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had a, an interesting lecture by the person who has taken his IELTS like a couple of weeks ago and after getting his uh, Bensko breakdown, we have realized that uh, he got perfect nine of task two in writing. So that's why please welcome with some warm applauses, Mr. Alijan. And the next person is uh, the representative of British Council, uh, the head of Exam, Exam's uh, department of British Council, Mr. Andre Maksakov. The next one, certified IELTS trainer of British Council. Uh, I think one of the most interesting uh, people we have invited ever, Mr. Erkin Mohamedov. <laughs> Mr. Dilshad Akarimov. Uh, I know him for a quite a long time. Uh, initially, he was one of the teachers of intonation, and now he's working on his own, uh, like very experienced person brilliant knowledge and really uh, satisfying speech on the previous lecture. So that's why I think you will enjoy his uh, answers on the questions. Please welcome with some warm applauses. <laughs> and yeah, you know who's the next. Uh, he has got his uh, perfect nine recently and that's why we have decided to invite him. You know, uh, sometimes he is coming to the intonation to give lectures on IELTS practicum. And yeah, Mr. Alex. So guys, uh, all guests are here and now it's time to get uh, some information about them. So can you raise your hand? Hi, hi. hello. <laughs> By the way, uh, can you raise your hand if you were born in 2006, 2006, 2007, 2005? Okay, I started teaching in 2006. When I came out to the class and I was talking to my students, when I said the date that I started, first year that I started teaching, I figured out that they were even younger than the age that I started teaching English. So. One more time, 2006, people born in 2006. Yeah, that's the time I started teaching English. I was so, three years old at the time. Okay. Three years old. <laughs> yeah, and for the past 16 years or so, I am teaching IELTS. I'm preparing candidates for the IELTS exam. So I have recently launched my own program, IELTS Pro. Um, so my name is Barno. I'm an English teacher. I prepare students for IELTS. That's it. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Uh, I started teaching almost at the same time as Ms. Barno. So, uh, but I also had different background in banking for a couple of years, logistics again, a couple of years. Uh, and finally, uh, I came to, to realize that teaching was like my passion. So I had a lot of job satisfaction teaching my students, seeing their results, achieving their goals, uh, helping them, you know, to uh, like get into universities, right? 
So I felt like this was the job that, you know, I finally, you know, uh, could enjoy a lot. So I, I chose teaching, finally. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrei Maksakov. I'm head of exams business for British Council Uzbekistan. And uh, on behalf of British Council, thank you very much for uh, joining today's meeting. And uh, it's amazing to have you all here. Uh, my background is in teaching, obviously, as you can see, it stays with you forever. <laughs> Once a teacher, forever a teacher. Uh, but it used to be way before most of you were born, to be honest. Um, then I had a lot of experience working for commercial organizations, and now I represent British Council's exams department. So whenever you have uh, all those questions about exams deliveries, uh, the places where we hold our exams, different types of exams, that would be me answering those questions. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Erkin. Um, I work with sometimes with Alexei. Uh, yeah, sorry, it was Andre. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was Andre. Uh, my background is uh, quite uh, broad. Uh, so, uh, teacher, teacher trainer, materials developer, and assessor. Um, as an assessor, I'm not an examiner. Don't consider me as an examiner. But my main job is IELTS wise, uh, I work with uh, teachers. Okay? Uh, teacher training. Uh, but uh, my main job is at uh, Westminster International University in Tashkent. So later, if you have any questions about Westminster as well, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Delshot, and my surname is Karimov. And everybody knows me as Mr. Karimov. Uh, and uh, I've been teaching uh, teaching since I was 16, so that's kind of teaching English. Uh, and one interesting thing is that uh, I hate teaching IELTS because it's boring. I find it very boring. Uh, teaching general English is more interesting for me. Uh, but the market, uh, the life uh, forced me to teach IELTS as well. Uh, and Plus, right now, uh, I'm running my own language school, uh, which I had to, I have to do it. Uh, and I hate doing business, but I like teaching. Uh, like, I, I, really, I enjoy uh, staying in the classroom. But again, life forced me uh, to get out of the classroom. One, two, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex. And uh, I am a native speaker. I'm from Kentucky. Uh, a bit complicated, but um, I got nine this month for the IELTS test in October, the beginning of October. I had been taking IELTS for about, I think, like three years. Uh, I, was, I was working on uh, getting a higher score with the biggest thing holding me back, writing task one something that a lot of you probably understand. Writing task one is difficult. Um, and I finally defeated the beast somewhere around uh, you know, the beginning of last month. And uh, from there, I realized that the time has come. And I decided to take the test over and over until I could get nine. And I did. Uh, I have a Telegram channel. I run a Telegram channel uh, called Alex Native IELTS. And I teach IELTS. That's about it. Now it's time to start the Q&A session. We have prepared some questions from the intonation team, and I hope you will enjoy them. And the first question is, what's the history of IELTS in Uzbekistan? Like, we need to know how it uh, started and how it uh, went through the times and how it is now. Um. Well, uh, that's a really uh, good question. Uh, if I remember, the first time I took IELTS was um, early noughties, um, 2003 or 2004. And that was in the Financial Academy. And uh, the way it was registered was totally different. I still remember this uh, a blue, um, what's it called? I, I forgot the word for this, oh my god. Um, 
the tape recorder, and it was it was a kind of a military tape recorder, military type of uh, tape recorder, uh, and exams used to happen in a small room uh, with about uh, 10, 15 people. Uh, that's my memory uh, of IELTS in Uzbekistan, but I might know more. Uh, but yeah, we were also earlier discussing like, you guys are uh, these days, I don't know, can I call you lucky or unlucky? I don't know, but yeah, uh, in the past, when you took uh, first, when you take an IELTS, and the next IELTS you can take was in three months only, right? But uh, now you can even take IELTS uh, twice a month or maybe more than, right? Uh, like now. <laughs> yeah, like now. <laughs> right. Yeah, Mar Barno, please. Yeah, we were discussing earlier, like I remember the times. For the first time I took the IELTS, it was 2008. Back those times, uh, you would take IELTS, and then for the next time, you would wait for another three months because they would give you three months to upgrade your skills, which I believe to be totally logical. But now, since IELTS has become, I'm not afraid to say that, and yeah, it, become, become, it has become more commercial. It depends on your pocket. Like, if you want, you can take it every day. If you want, you can take it every other day. Uh, I don't know, yeah, if it's good or bad, I don't know, but I believe, I want to believe that it's good because it's kind of a sign that people want to learn English, they want to study in international universities, and uh, yeah, I also took in financial academy. academy, yeah, and then Alex was pretty much notorious those times, and everybody was afraid of that examiner. There were a lot of gossips about Alexey Ulko, and then I was praying God that he wouldn't be my examiner. And guess what happens when you're afraid of something? <laughs> it approaches you. <laughs> but I didn't know that it was him because I was so nervous, I was so anxious. I skipped the part, he introduced himself and he told me his name. I was wearing pink tinted glasses back those times. So, but I still have warm memories about the history of IELTS in Uzbekistan. Do, do you remember the uh, cassette, uh, cassettes? Uh, maybe you don't know the word cassette at all. Uh, at that's, all. that's totally foreign language to them. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, yeah, the first exams, uh, listening exams, used to be on a cassette and uh, these tape recorders, they used to play these. And, uh, oh, somebody knows that, uh, good. Yeah, uh, it has become a history now. Right? Floppy disks. Right? Do you remember anything about yes. floppy disks? So you don't know anything maybe. Do you know what, I, what our parents do when they want to watch their wedding? Yeah, I uh, they go and to look for this uh, little black boxes. Yeah, and this is what is uh, Erkin Eke talking about. It's a video cassette, but uh, a listening exam was in a small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are, are you also feeling old? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just talking about the present. <laughs> uh, well, certainly there is a commercial aspect to IELTS, it's, and it's it's uh, not not something unusual because uh, of the wide scope and and uh, you know uh, the demand for this uh, service. You know, but uh, you should also. Uh, pay attention to the fact that uh, there have been a lot of improvements, to be honest, right? Uh, so first of all, uh, even if we talk about IELTS on paper, this is something that we consider to be a redundancy, uh, you know, something that we, we do only because you guys still want it. And that probably has to do something with the way you prepare at schools, with the way you train and do your studying in general, you know. Uh, pretty much every neighboring country that does IELTS nowadays in our region uh, have, uh, has moved, moved on to do uh, IELTS on computer. And so basically to sum up, uh, we can run IELTS on paper four times per month nowadays. It's three Saturdays and one Thursday. Those dates are fixed by Cambridge. They are pretty much set for everyone and uh, yeah. Uh, we have to book papers in advance. When it comes to IELTS on computer, it's a much more modern way to take an exam. It can be run uh, every single day of the week, three times per day, and uh, 
I think a lot of innovation is also happening in IELTS on computer as well. Uh, because uh, now, as you know, uh, uh, digital certificates are available as well. So once you've taken your exam on the computer, you can get your uh, uh, certificate in PDF format. Also, uh, I think uh, pre pretty soon, uh, one skill retake will be available uh, for IELTS on computer in Uzbekistan. What it means is that once you've done your IELTS test, and if you are not very happy with one particular score, like uh, Alex was trying to tackle his uh, writing task, right? He wouldn't have to um, take the whole IELTS exam again and again and again. He could just do one skill retake, and that is coming as well. Well, there is also IELTS uh, online. Uh, that product is not available in Uzbekistan yet. It's only in development stage and available in just a couple of countries around the world. Uh, also, what's important is that, of course, we talk a lot about I, uh, I Alex and whatever happened in the past, you know. But uh, IELTS is shrouded in, you know, myth and, you know, something uh, that people uh, say to each other, like he said, she said, whatever. But the truth of the matter is that there are multiple and multiple examiners available, both in person and uh, through computer, which we call video call speaking. And also, those examiners undergo rigorous selection and training process, of which I can explain later. We can talk about it. Um, and that basically excludes their prejudice about you, OK? So if you are afraid facing the examiner, you should not, because the only thing that examiners are actually concerned about is assessing your speaking abilities. And that's it, OK? Uh, we'll talk about it, OK? Moving on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, talking about CD uh, IELTS, uh, computer delivered IELTS. Um, you guys have your by a clock, right? Uh, some of you are morning person, some of you are evening person, right? Some of you work in the morning productively, some of you work in the afternoon productively, right? Uh, in the past, olden days, uh, we used to take IELTS only in the afternoons. But the good thing is now about CD IELTS. Uh, you can take it either in the morning or in the afternoon, uh, uh, depending on your by clock when you work uh, productively. Okay, that's a good thing uh, about uh, CD IELTS. And also, you can choose your speaking time yourself. Uh, sometimes, yeah, it might be changed uh, depending on the examiner's time, but usually the time you choose is kept for you. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for the next question. What's the missing for the average student to get the band score they want? So, um, imagine there is a person who is 15, 16 years old, uh, like any student at Intonation, studying, doing all the stuff to get the band score like 7.5 and an upper, uh, but he has some problems. What are the problems and how the person can resolve those problems? Yeah, before answering this question, uh, we should tell something that IELTS is 16 plus. So you should be taking IELTS when you are 16 and above. Okay? Uh, well, uh, it depends on what, what problem student is experiencing. Uh, if it's a reading problem, then uh, most probably students uh, are expected to learn more words. Uh, if it's writing, then uh, you ne they need to work on their expression skills. Uh, and I suggest my students uh, reading uh, Band 9 essays. Uh, and there are loads of uh, those essays on the internet. And try to like imitate and pretend them. Uh, not blindly, of course, uh, and yep. And if they have like some uh, what uh, listening problems, then uh, they well, you know what? Uh, for listening, for listening, uh, I tell my students to uh, to improve their listening skills overall, like in general, not like specific to IELTS. Uh, those who listen and understand really well can also like achieve uh, good scores uh, in IELTS listening as well. So that's why uh, when they are learning English like in general 
uh, what levels, like pre-intermediate, intermediate, or elementary, uh, they they should be working on their listening skills, like in general, so that uh, they don't struggle uh, when they reach uh, to the IELTS level. Yep, I hope I answered the question. I, I want to add uh, one more thing that I think a lot of people are missing, uh, which is a framework of understanding of the test format in general. I think a lot of people, you know, regardless of how much practice they do, as soon as they start, you know, taking IELTS, let's say practice tests, uh, a lot of students think that what they did the first time is what they will see every single time. For example, if the first test they took, they got multiple choice questions, they think every test always has multiple cho choice questions in the same sections. Um, I think that a lot of students make very simple mistakes. Like, for example, uh, when you are writing down or transferring your answers to the transfer sheet, a lot of students might not know the best ways to do that or how to not make spelling mistakes or, you know, these kinds of sp specific formats for writing dates or for writing, like, road, et cetera, things like that. Um, so I would say probably another thing that I would recommend every single student to do is to invest time in every section of IELTS and looking at what kinds of things people make dumb mistakes with, stupid mistakes, not necessarily related to just your English, but related to the testing format. Because I think a lot of people, they get a lower score than they want, not because they have bad English or because their English level is lower than they think, but because they're just not necessarily aware of the IELTS test specifically. All right. Now, I would like to add some points. So a lot of students seen, right? They like we have a saying, right? Practice makes perfect. So I guess they get this wrong, eh? and they try to complete practice tests again and again. For example, they complete one practice test, then eh? they are not satisfied with their results, and then they print out another one, and completing the practice tests again and again without analyzing their mistakes. Eh? So I would, you know, stress. I cannot stress enough that. Not quantity, but quality. Eh? Quality of the like analysis, right? And how much, how hard you work on your mistakes matters a lot, right? So I've seen lots of students, for example, completing a few practice tests, but I mean scoring high, eh? because they worked hard on their mistakes. They they realized their mistakes. Eh? So uh, I would encourage students not to complete endless number of practice tests, but to work really carefully, thoroughly on their mistakes, understanding those mistakes and thinking about how they could possibly avoid those mistakes in the future. Thank you. Well, I believe the very question of what holds back students from scoring the score they want to score actually is very open in the question. And it comes down to several factors. And you cannot just pinpoint the fact that they are not good at grammar, they are not very good at vocabulary. I have seen students struggle with discipline. I have seen students struggling from the pressure from the appearance, pressure from the peers that every other day someone is getting nine. Every other day, someone is getting 8.5, and the parents say, like, you've been taking the classes for the past three, four months, and then why the heck you are not getting eight, or why is your result not 8.5? This constant pressure of comparing, and you are teenagers, you are vulnerable to pressure, you are very much pressurized. And last time, like a month ago, my student secured 8.5 overall and she got eight in the writing part. And I wanna use her as an example and explain to you what we did with her. And I figured out that one of the biggest things that you really have to do is that mature adult, even if you are a teenager, you have to understand, you have to know what you don't know. You have to know what you don't know, which basically means like, a lot of students come and they say, I wanna get eight in the writing part. And I ask them, okay, what it takes to get eight in the writing part? Do you know the criteria assessment elements that it takes you to go for the eight from seven to eight? Like, uh, just count me five things you gotta do to get eight in the writing part. They can't. It's like illusion. It's something that they have been told that they have to do to stand out from the crowd. And then they believe that it's, I don't know, it's sexy to get eight in the writing part, I'm sorry. 
but they don't know what it takes to get aid. And then one of the biggest things that you have to discover, you have to discover what you don't know. And then I would share my, uh, the opinion of Alex here regarding the criteria assessment. Okay, study the criteria assessment. You need to know it like the back of your hand. Okay, to go for the aid, I need to do this, 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 and I don't know what. Know what you don't know, and then make a plan, practice, and then try to very much protect your psychological state in your mind, because all those people, even Alex being a native speaker, right? All of those people who are sitting here, Ali John, I've known him from dinosaurs era. We've struggled a lot, we've been told, like, you, you gotta get eight, you gotta get 8.5, you gotta get nine, and it's a lot of pressure. You are doing it for your own sake, and that don't let, I don't know, those people's constant pressure on you take, take over you. I believe being mentally healthy is one of the things that can actually accelerate this process of getting the score that you wanna score, guys. Thank you very much, Barno. Uh <clears throat> look, look, my dears, uh, first of all, uh, m my biggest question to you all is, do you really need <laughs> aid or whatever? Th that's, that's the thing, you see? Uh, if you are a language professional, you know, if you are someone who wants to dedicate their life to English, you know, uh, becoming a professional, you know, if you want to prove a point, th then it's fine. I mean, it's your personal achievement, you go for it, you work hard. But there is a thing, you know, I, I fully agree with uh, opinions of uh, some of the colleagues here that uh, I really enjoy English. I don't, uh, and I really enjoy teaching English, you know, talking about English, making use of English, and not preparing for exams. That's the whole thing. And uh, there is a simple, uh, there is a simple, progress check basically for you. If uh, you talk about band scores, those band scores align with the common European uh, framework reference, right? And uh, uh, those CFR, you know, A1, A2, B1, B2, and so on, uh, require the progression of moving from one band to another requires a certain amount of time spent in English. And we're living in Uzbekistan, uh, I'm actually amazed that so many of you have such high level of English because we don't have English speaking environment in this country. And uh, it is an essential thing if you want to progress in English. So if we don't have this environment and we want to progress, that means that we should artificially create this environment for ourselves. And that means that you will have to spend hours and hours and hours uh, interacting with English actively or passively or whatever. Uh, but if you really want to enjoy life, you know, if you really want to become an IT specialist, you know, an engineer, a doctor or whatever, I think you should be spending your time training for those things and making sure that your English is good enough to get into the colleges you want, the universities you want, and, uh, you know, writing essays, reading books, and interacting with other professionals, okay? So, I mean, I work for an international organization. English is our working language. I don't have nine in writing or in other things, you know? But I don't feel that my life is limited in any way, okay? And so, basically, decide for yourselves, okay? If, the, if it's something that you want to do, go ahead, work hard, and achieve. That, that will be an excellent accomplishment. We will applaud you, but if you want other things in your life, make sure that your English is good enough to get you into a good college, you know, here in Uzbekistan or abroad. And I think that's that's the most important thing. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Uh, you guys should be using the language suggested by your teachers properly. Most of the time, for example, your teachers uh, suggest language, especially for speaking, uh, time buyers. Oh, that's an interesting question, right? Unfortunately, during the exam, uh, students do not use it properly. Examiner is asking question, what's your name? And the answer is, oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Hello, your name is interesting? So you should use uh, authentic English. Be yourself, 
try to use uh, and try to be as natural as possible. You don't have to sound fancy. So uh, do lots of listening. You would speak better. Uh, and one more thing that I want to add to uh, Ms. Barna Mukimova's uh, opinion, that uh, there is a wrong, uh, I think, conception of uh, evaluating the teachers. Uh, so nowadays, uh, students or English learners, they chase after uh, teachers who got higher score from IELTS. But bear in mind that uh, teacher A who got uh, seven, let's say, from IELTS, and teacher B who got like eight from IELTS, okay? So that eight does not make him or her better than the teacher A. So this uh, band scores just show uh, how many words we know or how uh, how many of them we can use, like as uh, Erkinek has said, uh, in authentic way. Uh, but it doesn't make us like uh, like better teachers or something else. So that's why stop uh, like looking for somebody who got like eight, nine, something, something. So just and also like when you learn English, enjoy it, enjoy the moment, enjoy the process. Not uh, try to get like a nine or to get like forty questions, something. Позвольте мне закрыть этот вопрос встречным вопросом к публике. И тут сначала просьба. Поднимите руки те, кто считает, что им нужен IELTS чисто для, для того, чтобы поступить в университет. IELTS для того, чтобы поступить в университет. Выше, выше, пожалуйста. Ага, большинство. 90% университетов в мире принимают 6,5 как проходной балл. Магистратуру. То есть, если вы собрались быть э, исследователем при университете, учить у них магистратуру, минимум, который им нужен, это 6,5. Бакалавриат и то меньше. То есть, э, все, что сказали эти прекрасные люди сейчас, это не теряйте время, э, преследуя то, что вам на самом деле в жизни не пригодится. То, что она и так коротка. Пользуйтесь моментом, учитесь свое удовольствие и э, никогда не гоните за тем, что кажется классным в разрезе какой-то публики. То, что вы делаете, должно казаться классным для вас и должно являться классным для вас. Поэтому, да, переходим к следующему вопросу. Спасибо. Like we have often heard that the assessment in British Council and IDP differs in final scores. Many say that in IDP they overestimate the score a little, when in British Council, vice versa. What do you think? Okay. Right, so let me ask you a question first. Why do you... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So wh why exactly are you paying almost $200 to take your IELTS exam? You know, I'm sure pretty much that if you speak to, to, to yeah, yeah. If you, if you, uh, you know, spend some time with either of us, you know, or present here, I think uh, after maybe 15 minutes, we'll approximately tell you that you are, let's say, B1, B2, or whatever level, right? Will that be enough for you? I mean, I can tell you, okay, this person is B2. I will even sign you uh, a piece of paper confirming that. Obviously not, right? So one of the key important selling points of IELTS compared to all the other uh, uh, English tests, you know, there are plenty of those online, most of them are free of charge, is the acceptance uh, by uh, leading educational institutions, right? More than 11,000 universities all over the world accept uh, IELTS. And they do so because of trust and reliability, okay? If there is any shadow of doubt that the score is inconsistent, you get this score higher, lower, whatever, that means that the test is not valid, that test does not fit the purpose, right? And then basically you shouldn't forget that uh, IELTS is basically owned by three organizations, right? Cambridge, British Council, and IDP. And each of those organizations through participation in the uh, general board make sure that uh, 
the standards are maintained and implemented, okay? Uh, then, basically, we have a layer of um, selection and training and monitoring uh, to monitor speaking, writing, uh, speaking and writing examiners, okay? To become an examiner, you need to meet certain standards in the first place. And uh, when we talk about speaking examiners, you don't really have to be a native speaker, like many people think. Uh, let's take Alex here, for example, even though he is a native speaker from US, but uh, you get nine, right, in speaking, and you can have 8.0 in all the other aspects. You don't have to be nine in all the scores, okay? Then you should have uh, at least three years progressive teaching experience of uh, adults. And then basically you should also have a proper, proper education like TESOL, certificates, CELTAs, and some other things. And then basically you are shortlisted, you go through an interview, and then you qualify for a training, you, you train really hard, uh, and after that you become an examiner, but you are being introduced into profession very slowly. You know, you are given a certain number of test takers, then your results are monitored, and so on. And then once you are an examiner, I mean, you work, you have certificate, which is valid for two years. All your scores, all the scoring that you do, they are evaluated and monitored regularly, okay? If there is any discrepancy in the scores that you provide, you become suspended, you can no longer examine, and that means that you lose a highly paid, very uh, uh, good job, okay? And so none of the examiners are interested in this, and so they maintain rigorously the standards, all right? And so <clears throat> basically across different organizations like IDP and British Council, we have the same standards in terms of examiner selection, their training, preparation, monitoring, and so on. Besides that, IELTS has built in um, kind of processes that prevents from, you know, assigning higher or lower scores on whatever. Uh, first of all, our scores and colleagues can confirm here, uh, I mean the language professionals, that they basically align to one another. You cannot really have extremely good speaking and, and horrible listening, you know, or extremely good writing and horrible reading. So those scores have to match and align. And if there is any discrepancy, there is a thing which is called a jagged profile. So if we assign you a score and then there is a discrepancy with other scores that you have, the system will trigger re-evaluation, okay? That means that the score will be anonymously examined by other examiners, the score will be brought forward, and it can happen up to three times actually to make sure that the score you're receiving is correct. And once uh, you receive your score, you are happy, you got your certificate, whatever, uh, but the story for the examiners does not end there, some of the examiners, if they assign a lower score, will be brought into monitoring, maybe suspended, or maybe, I mean, their certificate may be even, you know, revoked from them. So that means that IELTS is extremely, extremely reliable. And also, you shouldn't forget uh, one very simple thing, is that uh, what exactly do you think a language test measures? Who can answer me this question? It's a very simple question. What does IELTS measure? Mm, that's quite interesting. Huh? <laughs> like, All right. How high can, can you jump probably? No, look. IELTS measures your language abilities, skills, competencies on the day you take the test. All right? So, I mean, the certificate is valid for two years, which in my opinion is ridiculous. We have other uh, English tests in British Council family, uh, which were developed by extremely competent uh, professors uh, like Barry O'Sullivan. He's one of the key minds in assessment in the global uh, academia. And um, like, for example, Aptis test does not have a, uh, a you know, expiry date for the certificate. And when we asked that question, like, why, why, why is that the case? We, were, we received a very simple answer. It's because the test measures your ability right now, like today. What happens in two years, we don't know. I mean, you may work really hard, 
live in US or UK, and then your language will improve dramatically. Or maybe you relocate somewhere in the mountains, shut down and, you know, and, and, and don't read any books or whatever, uh, do the gardening and stuff. And then your language will go down because simply you don't use the language. And that's the thing, okay? So, which is why the whole notion of, you know, I took the test here and then I took the test there or whatever, I got different scores, does not make any sense, okay? Because the circumstances in which you take the test, the questions that you receive, your mood, what you had for breakfast, will actually influence the score you get. But one thing should be understood correctly, you know, half a band score is a natural correlation, okay? It, it means that, like, if we talk about, you know, very simple stuff here with you now, I will show you a certain level of English. If we talk, you know, about medicine, if we talk about the chemistry or whatever, my English will worsen, you know, I will not know half of the words. And that means that, you know, depending on the circumstances, your, your knowledge of English demonstrated, okay, will not be like a straight line. It will be like a curved line. And, and that's it. And this is why, returning to our previous conversation, if the university you're applying for requires a score 6, and you get whatever, 6.5, 7 in your IELTS, should you really care that much? I mean, you, you, you got where you want it. Now train to become a professional, you know, forget about English and just basically enjoy your training. I, I think they want to get their money back. Uh, therefore, <laughs> they, they need seven plus. One thing is uh, we are not here uh, to say uh, organization A is better than organization B. Yeah, uh, both organizations follow the same standards, but uh, factors are really different, uh, like the topic, the task type, right? Some of you, for example, may write, uh, may describe a uh, pie chart brilliantly, but when it comes to, I don't know, the other task type, you might be horrible at it, right? And in organization A, you had the task type you are really good at, and in uh, organization B, um, you had another task. So, and then the result would be different as well. So uh, you shouldn't say that like, oh, that was the examiner. That wasn't the examiner, that was a factor. That was a factor because uh, in certain areas you are knowledgeable more than in other areas. You see? So therefore, you need to consider all the uh, factors. It's not about the organization. It's about the factors uh, around the uh, test taking. Already about uh, sleeping, your sleeping habits, your eating habits. All this actually might uh, influence. That's, that's another reason why we insist on uh, this exam being taken by older people, like adults, you know, 14 years of age is not good enough to take IELTS test, simply because of this fact that you will have very little life experience, you know, and that will affect your score. У меня философия очень простая. Sorry, I will be using Uzbek, Russian, English, because I really want to deliver the message better to you. Какая? Если вы будете думать, что British Council ставит ниже, IDP ставит выше, так и будет. Если вы думаете, что Алекс всегда занижает Марк, это так и будет. Надо понять одно, все это относительно, и то, что для меня легко, для вас, для вас это будет трудно. И что вам трудно, для меня, может быть, легко будет. Допустим, у меня был вопрос про фиш. Я только кушать фиш умею. А про типы фиш я не могу говорить, про types of fish, etc. Там был даже вопрос, я 6 сентября пересдала свой IELTS. И там идет такой вопрос, а ты знаешь какой-нибудь мультик про фиш? И, и, и я очень духовный человек, I like philosophy and things like that. И я смотрю на него, и я говорю, ты знаешь, я только жрать фиш умею. Fry, cook, and etc. И за 16 лет вы не представляете, каких uh, stories my students told me for the explanation why they didn't get the score they wanted. Один раз мальчик приходит и говорит, вы знаете, почему я получил 6, 
а не 6,5, а мой друг получил 6,5, хотя я должен был получить. I should have gotten 6,5, and he should have gotten 6. Я говорю, интересно, расскажи. Он говорит, потому что он мою воду взял, говорит. А я говорю, как это связано? В те времена можно было с водичкой заходить, а сейчас вы воду сами даете. Я говорю, как это работает? Он говорит, ой, ух ты, кендале, ты суна, говорит. Понимаете? Я говорю, ой, ух ты, кендале, я ж не отвышу. Работает. И говорит, вот он по ошибке, заряженная водичка была. И, и говорит, вот он по ошибке мою водичку взял, говорит, ух ты, суна. Вот он получил шестипя. Вы просто не представляете, да, каких stories for the explanation за 16 лет. У меня даже студент, который карвовол выпил, потому что он нервничал, заходит. Был студент, который водку выпил, зашел на экзамен, потом пришел ко мне, рассказывает, ну, ну, понятно, что он чуть-чуть под градус. Ну, вы понимаете, каждый tries to cope and manage this in the way they know. И это все на самом деле разные истории. Вам надо понять, люди, хорошие мои, мир вокруг вас не крутится. Экзаменаторы, я работала экзаменатором. Я CAE, FCE, PTE экзамен принимала. Как только вы выйдете, мы думаем о своей кошке. Мы думаем, что надо купить, надо бананы купить, апельсины купить домой. Мы забываем про вас. А студенты, особенно teenagers, they think that the whole world revolves around them. Я сейчас зайду, он посмотрит, прическа там, что, как, нормально, парфюм. Это хорошо, но take it easy, okay? Take it easy, enjoy, кайфуйте от себя. Заходите, кайфуйте, говорите. Uh, главное, чтобы себе нравилось. О чем мы делаем? Instead of it, we sing. А я сейчас скажу, что мне не нравится reading, он подумает, что я какая-то тупая. Я сейчас скажу, что в мое свободное время я like sleeping, а он подумает, что о, oh, lazy. И мы себе, we cheat on ourselves. We are not natural. Вот самый популярный совет, да, коллеги, поддержите. Самый популярный совет. Be natural. Be natural. И давайте drill down. Что такое being natural? Это не только vocabulary, это не только grammar. It's you. Хватит, stop pretending. Я вообще первый экзамен, когда у меня был вопрос. Talk about the sport you're not good at, but you would like to master. Я 11 лет, я училась в танцевальной школе. Я говорю, для меня танцы — это как спорт. Понимаете? И я прям встала, я помню, я прям встала, говорю, the hardest part is to maintain eye contact. Потому что я не знала, что во время спикинга нельзя вставать. Я не знала. Я показывала with my body language вот это вот трудно еще улыбаться, ржать, когда ты нервный. Вот это вот самый трудный part, говорю. Понимаете, люди, рамки у вас в голове. Если бы мне сказали, помните тот мотивационный, популярный story? Гарвард или где-то, Эйнштейн даже не мог решить задачу, и студент приходит, он опоздал, и он записывает как домашнее задание, приходит, решил. Даже Эйнштейн не решил эту задачу, потому что блока не было у него в мозге, в башке. Ему не говорили, никто не решил, и он решил. Мне никто не говорил, что нельзя вставать, нельзя ржать, нельзя быть natural. А я такой человек, я энергетик, Red Bull. Я встала, я показываю, потому что мне никто не говорил. У меня не был английский такой хороший, но у меня 8 вышло с первого раза. For speaking. Поэтому кайфуйте от себя, кайфуйте от процесса. Да, вот, он правильно говорит. Я тоже чуть-чуть ненавижу IELTS, но это мананоним. Понимаете? Это мой хлеб, не надо зарабатывать, кормить себя кошек своих, которых еще нету. Ну, вы поняли, вы же умные ребята, камон. Получится, все будет. Делайте ради себя. Окей? Okay? Be natural. Ладно, друзья. Водку перед экзаменом не пьем, пьем Red Bull. Если, если, если написано, что вставать нельзя, вставать можно. Можно? Следующий вопрос. What is the most unusual request you have ever received from a student preparing for exam? Is the question to the teachers? Student приехал и говорит, мисс Парно, пожалуйста, выйдите. Please come out. I need, I'm going for the speaking test and I need to submit you one trial part two speaking. Я говорю, 
окей, вышла такая. И он говорит, uh, I had a dream, and in my dream my examiner asked me, describe a painting or picture you have at home. Ну, рассказал две минуты, говорю, молодец, окей, okay. поехал, и у него этот вопрос был. I don't know, intuition or whatever. So that was unusual request student asked me. Like. How about this? Let me, just, let me just say, I think a lot of students have asked me, and I don't think this is unusual, but I think it's, it's a little bit out of the ordinary. A lot of students have asked me to come with them to the test on the day of their exam. Have any of you ever wanted to do this with your teacher? No? Okay, maybe it is unusual, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I had one student who, who was with me for about like two years, and uh, we went to a coffee shop like right next to IDP uh, the day of his exam, and we sat there for like one hour just talking. And uh, yeah, he, he scored quite well. So I think, you know, if you guys ever want to change your mind about that, invite your teachers, make sure to treat them well, pay for them, of course, and uh, that's about it. Uh, sometimes this happens, but very like rare times. Uh, you know, there are some guys like Kuczynski guys. Okay, <laughs> they come and they say, "Okay, shu ayl sokabna halk sabomidema." Then I say, "If you can, why not?" So that's like open market. Uh, so and sometimes they ask me if it's possible to fake the certificate. Yeah, so. A uh, yeah, very similar thing. I was asked to take an uh, exam for a student. So uh, they didn't know that actually I work with British Consul as well. So. <laughs> because most of the examiners knew me that time very well. Yeah. One like unusual request from students that was like uh, during lockdown, you know, we had the test like IELTS indicator, right? So a lot of a lot of people in Uzbekistan, I think, you know, know this. Uh, they had double screen, right? S some of the students asked me to do the test, you know, for them, you know, installing double screens. Eh? On the one side, he's sitting, right? On the other side, I'm like doing the test. Like, so they asked me to do that. Uh, obviously, I rejected, right? <laughs> so they, they offered some, I mean, uh, reasonable amount of money. But I mean, like, uh, what is haram? You know, I don't accept. So. That that was the most unusual request that I got, you know, from a couple of students. Just to comment on the um, online exams, basically, colleagues, look, uh, whatever happened during the uh, COVID times uh, was extremely, extremely stressful and unusual environment for everyone, right? And so uh, nowadays, all the online exams have extremely um, complicated system of proctoring where it has both live proctors and AI, which means that uh, that sort of thing will would never work nowadays. Uh, yeah, but uh, because of COVID, people were extremely shocked. Uh, li sort of, I mean, you remember this, life pretty much stopped for everyone. Uh, universities still needed to enroll people. I think UK at that point lost pretty much uh, most of its applicants to universities and it was a huge impact on uh, uh, their national budgets as well. Uh, and so, of course, extreme measures require extreme uh, actions on behalf of many organizations. Uh, yeah, and, and this is one of the reasons why actually we do not rush introducing any online exams in Uzbekistan once we feel 100% comfortable in the technology, in the you know, uh, all the aspects of test delivery we will facilitate. So far, computer-based exams are basically our uh, uh, modern and uh, absolutely up-to-date technology that we request you to take. Так, начну с небольшого экскурса. Очень многие студенты думают, что экзамен в Узбекистане в целом оценивается ниже именно IELTS, нежели в других странах, допустим, многие говорят, что если поехать в Казахстан, если у тебя 7, то ты получишь 8. Поднимите руки те, кто так же думает. Да. Никто не так не думает, да? Отлично. 
Ну, исходя из своего опыта экзаменатора в Интернейшн, я очень много раз слышал, что студенты, которые сдают экзамены в Узбекистане, а потом пересдают где-то в Шимкенте, они получают стабильно на 0,5, либо на 1 балл больше. Я не знаю, с чем это связано, поэтому вопрос следующий. To what extent do you think the examination standards and criteria are consistent across different countries? And how can we ensure fair and uniform evaluation of candidates' language proficiency in the IELTS test globally? I'll take this uh, answer. This bit pretty much refers me to the previous explanation I already gave you on the examiner standards. And the second part is how we can ensure uh, you cannot, that's what we do. <laughs> that's our job to ensure that the standards are the same. No, seriously speaking, look, again, uh, different exams have different levels of uh, stake is what we call it, okay? IELTS is a high stakes exam. That means that a lot depends uh, on this exam for people who take it, right? And so as the stakes are very high, uh, it is extremely difficult for people to actually look in the mirror and be honest, like, you know, am I well prepared? <laughs> uh, have I worked really hard, you know? So once you, you don't achieve the score you wanted, like everything becomes, uh, a problem, like, you know, oh, it's because in Chimkan they give higher score, or oh, it's because I didn't like this location or whatever. And it's very simple for us because, you know, since we test thousands and thousands of test takers each year, we get a lot of feedback. And uh, whenever you have a person who achieved the score they desired or even higher, and if you ask them, like, for any feedback, they're like, oh, everything was amazing, you know. People work great, invigilators work great, venue was fine and stuff, you know, you are the best, whatever. When they don't get the score they wanted, oh, you know, it's, 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 you know, I wasn't in the traffic jam. The examiner looked at me a weird way, you know. I, the topic was horrible, you know, my teacher didn't support me enough and everything becomes a problem. <clears throat> so again, returning to the question of what is IELTS? IELTS test the knowledge you have. So if you have the knowledge, you'll get the score you want, you know. Just be realistic. You cannot demand an eight score if your knowledge supports only six. That, that's the problem, right? Let me tell you about my personal experience with IELTS. Uh, of course, I mean, I, I represent the business uh, part of IELTS and I know pretty much everything about the delivery, the, the standards and other things. But as it happens, I only took IELTS once in my life because simply I never needed to. That's, that's the thing. And uh, I took this exam because we were updating some of the systems. My colleague said, like, look, do you want to take the exam? I said, I don't, I don't have, do I have to? Like, they said, yeah, you can, you can do it if you want to support us. I said, fine, when do I take it? They're like, tomorrow. Uh, okay, tomorrow, fine. And so basically I went in, I took the exam, and oh my God, what a surprise. I got nine in speaking, 8.5 in listening and writing, in reading, and, and uh, I got, I think, 6.5 in writing, okay? And wh why is that? Oh, because they gave me a, s a lower score or something. I mean, I got nine in speaking. I know my abilities in English. That's because I never prepared. I never cared about academic writing or whatever, you know? Had I spent enough time preparing for it, I would get the score I wanted. But do I need it? No. Does it bother me? No. That's the thing, okay? So just relax. Scoring Everywhere is the same. You going to Thailand does not get you a nine if you know at level six, you know. That, that's the thing, okay? So IELTS has a lot of myth and, you know, whatever, uh, rumors, he said, she said. So just relax about it. Prepare for your general English. Get yourself accustomed to the format of the exam. What are the requirements, some techniques around the speaking part, some techniques around writing part, and you'll do just fine. You know, it's just an exam. All right. Uh, we have a program on Discovery Channel, which is called Miss Busters. <laughs> so I like busting myth. <laughs> so I had a group of students who really wanted to take the test both in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. They had a lot of money. I mean, they were from like uh, affluent families. Eh? So I said, why not? Let's, you know, bust this myth finally. Yeah? So they all took their exams in Uzbekistan and got their scores. Next week, they went to Kazakhstan. 
uh, and they took the exactly the same scores. I mean, like individual sections were different, but I mean, general overall score was the same. So I just wanted to prove my students that wherever you you know take the test, there. So standards are the same. All examiners are trained by like Cambridge experts. Eh? The test is designed by Cambridge. You you take it at, at IDP Bridge Council. Eh? I had to do the same. I took the test at IDP with Bridge Council. I had the same scores. Eh? So uh, I mean uh, everything depends on how well you prepare it and how well you do right on the exam day. Right, we have something which is called exam date performance. Eh? Maybe, uh, you know, I, I had one student who took the exam twice. For his first score was 7.5. After one week, he took the exam. His score was 8.5. I mean, can he really improve his exam score from 7.5 to 8.5 in one week? No way. But th that, that was due to exam date performance. He actually had background to get 8.5, but on the day he got 7.5, he, he was not in a mood. That, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, and just basically uh, another uh, interesting uh, example from our experience, right? So when we launched IELTS on computer in Uzbekistan, we started noticing overall that uh, scores of test takers who take IELTS on computer were higher in general, like in general. And we were wondering like, what's going on? Like, why are the scores higher? And uh, then of course it hit us that uh, when we studied the, the uh, test takers, basically looked at the profile of the test takers, we pretty much discovered that most of the test takers who took IELTS on computer were, in general, much better prepared. You know, <laughs> they, they had better computer skills, they were slightly better educated, they had uh, you know, slightly better English as a result. So basically, let's say, if we had IELTS on computer, th that's a rough thing, okay? But uh, we had students, like let's say A students taking IELTS on computer and A and B students taking IELTS on paper, okay? And so as a result, when we took the averages, we saw that taking IELTS on computer gave us higher scores, but not due to the assigning of higher scores, but simply because most of these students were much better prepared. They had better skills, that's it. Uh, I want to actually mention this is exactly something that I've I've been thinking about for a while. From all the people that have gone in Uzbekistan, there are seven of them. All of them have taken IELTS on computer. Not a single one has gotten IELTS nine on paper. Hello. Uh, not none of them have gotten nine on paper. And I think uh, the format itself, taking the test on computer, it requires you to already have a certain level of preparedness. You already need to know how to work with a mouse. And I think most teachers, if you know, you ask your teacher, at what level should I take IELTS on computer, they will tell you you need at least 30 words per minute for your writing speed, preferably around 40 or 50. So I think that definitely, uh, as you mentioned, it's really about the fact that the students who take the computer IELTS, they're already more equipped to take IELTS in general. I think that's one of the biggest things. And I, I want to mention, so, um, we were talking about getting different scores depending on your mood, depending on how you feel, and these kinds of things. Uh, the first time I took IELTS was in 2019. And I got writing seven. My writing score was seven. And the next month, I was planning to book my ticket to Kazakhstan. I was talking to other IELTS instructors, and they told me, the only way to get a better score would be to go directly to Almaty or you know some other Nur Sultan someplace and get a better score by taking IELTS in Kazakhstan. And luckily, I didn't do that because I think those tickets they cost too much. And uh, in the end, after three or four years, I took the test after actually understanding what my mistakes were. So as we have been saying over and over and over, it's not about all of the outside factors that you cannot influence, it's about the factors that you can influence. How you feel, how you are thinking about the test, and what kind of mindset you have going in. And especially whether or not you're analyzing what you're actually doing wrong. Because even though you cannot know what mistakes you made on test day, you can measure what mistakes you make on average a lot more in your practice. So it's, it's, it's really about just analyzing where you went wrong rather than blaming the test for giving you a lower score than you deserve, deserve.
last question from the from our team. Is there any secrets of getting high scores? Yeah, there is a secret. Learn and love English language, and <laughs> that that's it. You know, and and again, it really depends on what high scores are we talking about. You know, for someone who is. Uh, you know, band five, moving on to band seven, that's a high score. That requires a lot of effort, learning and studying, you know. For someone who is 8.5 going to nine, maybe not so much. I mean, just just uh, a couple of months hard work and then you get your nine, whatever. But it, it's all very relevant, very individual. My only thing is always, you know, don't bother. Get the score that, that gets you places and then just relax about it and, and enjoy the language. The English language is much wider, more interesting, more exciting, opens doors for you than, than IELTS. IELTS is there to support you, okay? And uh, just basically uh, returning to that IELTS on computer conversation, um, uh, I, I think uh, in general, being in tune with, with modern day and age will help you get higher scores. It's like when I was a kid learning English, I literally had to travel across, to the other side of town to a resource center. I think it was uh, back then arranged by a cafe uh, in Chursu, uh, one of the departments of uh, uh, University of World Languages. And uh, it was extremely difficult getting there. Then all the materials were hard copy. Uh, maximum you could, go, you could get a, a, a video cassette, you know, like VHS. And, and then you had to, you know, find a friend or someone to download transcript and, you know, study English at home. Nowadays, you really, really have to be super lazy or not interested in English language to not learn it, you know. You get a bunch of resources and you can create uh, artificial English environment around yourselves. You know, if you are tired of studying your books, you know, you can watch a movie, you have your subtitles, you can listen to music, do whatever, you know, find, find a, you know, chat group and, and uh, talk to someone from UK, whatever, using internet. In, in our day and age, it was extremely difficult. It was like almost like a personal goal or achievement like you know where you you had to dedicate a ton of money and effort and time to 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 really get there sometimes you wouldn't have even textbooks you would have to photocopy them uh, i mean nowadays you get excellent textbooks you get wonderful uh teaching centers like international here you know brilliant teachers to support you so yeah just just work and understand that progression will require time and effort and that's it and you'll get there well, I just want to reinforce your point. Eh? So a lot of students are, you know, focused too much on the exam preparation. Eh? So I would suggest this, right? Prepare for your IELTS in a non-IELTS way. I mean, like, work on your general English. Eh? Read books, eh? watch movies, you know, listen to podcasts, okay? Forget about your exam f for a time being, I mean, like. So uh, if you are, I mean, too concentrated on your, like, exam, right? I mean, like excessively, right? To a degree that that drives you crazy. Okay, that's not good. That's not, I mean, sound. Okay, all right. So take it easy. I wanna, I wanna do something. I wanna give an answer that's a little bit different. That is in the spirit of the question. Okay, secrets is like a keyword that drives students wild. I think a lot of people think that there's like some secrets to IELTS. Let me tell you. Okay, there is. There's one. But all of you have to promise. Okay, look at me right now. Promise me you will not tell anyone. This is only between us, okay? Okay, this is like a real IELTS secret. Chat GPT. And I don't mean you can use Chat GPT on the test to write your exam. A lot of students think it's that. No, you cannot take your phone with you. But Chat GPT has become the most instrumental tool for a lot of people to get higher scores. Raise your hand if you've ever used Chat GPT right now. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've used ChatGPT more than once. Okay, pretty good, same amount of people. So if you have never used ChatGPT, I just wanna tell you, there is a free Telegram bot where you can use ChatGPT for free. I know it's blocked in Uzbekistan. Everybody says, you know, me, 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 I can't use ChatGPT. You can use it, it's literally out there. 
So what you can do with ChatGPT, it's something called a language model. ChatGPT is not a person. You know, when you ask it a short question, it feels like somebody's answering you. But when you ask it a longer question, it writes 10, 15 paragraphs in a couple seconds. So ChatGPT is not a person or some kind of, you know, robot that knows things. It doesn't know anything. It's a language model, a predictive language model. The only thing ChatGPT does is it looks at the word that it has, and then it guesses the next word, and then the next word, and then the next word. And logically, through how people normally speak, ChatGPT makes texts and answers and words and phrases. So what I would recommend all of you to do is to use the power of ChatGPT for your speaking and especially for your writing. ChatGPT can do so many different things. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm not as good with ChatGPT. I never used it in my preparation. And I am very sorry about that because I feel like I could spend much less time worrying about my IELTS if I actually just understood how to correctly use ChatGPT. Uh, do any of you guys use ChatGPT in any way in your, in your teaching? I would love to. Uh, well, I use ChatGPT and I'm having a session in the afternoon in two hours uh, to my master's students about uh, artificial intelligence uh, in general. Um, I have used ChatGPT for IELTS purposes. I asked the ChatGPT, uh, uh, I think it was ChatGPT and the cloud, uh, cloud two, uh, to assess uh, the same work. And unfortunately, it actually varied, varied for note 0.5. Uh, once uh, it actually gave seven, and the second time I asked uh, to assess that it was a task two type writing. Uh, second time, it, it gave like 6.5, and that was interesting because I was having session with my uh, colleagues, and I asked, okay, this is a task uh, two type uh, essay, please just assess it. Uh, and when you use artificial intelligence, it's really important how you put the prompt, prompt instructions, how you give the instructions. The clearer instructions, uh, uh, the better it might work. But uh, Whatever the outcome is, you will have to take with a pinch of salt, okay? I definitely want to add, never ask ChatGPT for your score. Unfortunately, ChatGPT does not work for British Council. ChatGPT does not work for IDP. So uh, you can ask ChatGPT to, uh, to, to help you with your grammar, with your lexical resource, and with your uh, coherence and cohesion. But it's not a good idea to ask ChatGPT about your task achievement, because ChatGPT doesn't necessarily understand whether the task is achieved or not. So if you're asking ChatGPT, did I answer the question well? Did I answer it correctly? It cannot give you as good of an answer as if you ask it, is the grammar in this essay good and in which ways, et cetera, et cetera. So focus on the specific parts of your essay rather than the overall grading of your essay. ChatGPT is not like officially, they're not affiliated with British Council. They cannot give you a good score, so yeah. Это был последний вопрос от команды Intonation. В случае, если вы хотите задать вопрос out loud, любой вопрос, мы даем микрофон, пожалуйста, спрашивайте. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. How are you? So the question is, uh, Mr. You say there is a there shouldn't be discrepancy like getting nine 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 from task two and six 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 from task one. But are there the, uh, such kind of cases when students can get higher from task two and really lower from task one uh, in the writing section? Uh, look, uh, to be honest, I, I am not a professional uh, examiner, so I, I think I'm not really qualified to give that answer, okay? Uh, I think maybe uh, Erkin Akai here can uh, explain this better. But uh, look, uh, the, the total scores in, in components is a summative score, right? So that means it can definitely, and, and the, the, the overall nature of those tasks is different. So you can be really good in, in one type of task and really not so good with the other type of task. That's pretty much exactly what happened with me when I took my test, right? Because I was not familiar with the format of the test. I was not prepared for specific components. And then when I spoke to uh, our uh, trained uh, professionals uh, about this, and I said, look, I consider myself to be a good English speaker, you know, a proficient user. 
So I didn't get it because I thought that, you know, my writing was really brilliant. I mean, I, I laid out stuff and whatever, and they just sort of laughed at me and said, look, uh, you probably just overdid it <laughs> to a point where the, the requirement was very simple. You just had to link these points and whatever. And so this is pretty much the case. And this is why what we are trying to suggest is that your overall knowledge of English should be quite good. And then you get yourself acquainted with the format of the test. Like what are they actually assessing? What are the requirements to the specific components? And then when you match these two together, you'll get your, the, the good score you deserve, okay? Because otherwise, you may have the knowledge but not know the format of the test and you can be in trouble like myself, <laughs> okay? Um, in writing, you know, there is task achievement, right? Uh, when your task achievement is a law, uh, there, is all, there might be issues of uh, vocabulary as well, because uh, if you are uh, off topic, then basically you are also using a different vocabulary, right? So there might be the chance then your vocabulary may go down as well. Yeah, again, I'm not an uh, official examiner as well. Uh, I'm a teacher trainer. Next question from the public. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Salam. My surname is Mukhimuvaga. I guess the teacher will be against the case case against Bolardis. Okay. Waalaikum assalam. Ma'am, I have a question. The person is not a case. The case is not a case. Barber is not a case. It's not like only for teaching. I'm a very big, huge empath. I empathize very fast with people. I'm very emotional. So there are two ways I, sh I could have gone, two directions. The first one was teaching, because you have to have very high level of empathy, feel students, and guide them. And the second, was, second one was doctor. And initially, I had thought that I would end up becoming a doctor. But everything got changed when I was in the hospital, and for the first time I saw a blood, I almost lost my consciousness. And I figured out that if you're a doctor, uh, you actually see people coming to you and complaining, and happy people don't go to doctor, right? So all those people who come to doctor and seek doctor's help are people who struggle. Yeah, because I'm highly emotional, I thought like I wouldn't be able to cope. I wanted to see happy people around me. And then uh, I have pretty interesting relationship with teaching. Uh, sometimes I love teaching, sometimes I burn out, and then sometimes I lay in bed for three, four days, I go out to nature, and I start missing teaching. So we have very interesting relationship. I think even if I didn't decide consciously not to become teacher, I think this job would choose me eventually. So I have some difficulties with reading part. It's very difficult for me and I can uh, focus on the reading and uh, what I can do with that. Yeah, just uh, look, <clears throat> we're all human beings, right? And we're all very different. And uh, when, when people talk about the individual circumstances, it sometimes can be extremely difficult, right? Uh, some people may be dyslexic, okay? And that means that they will have this issue forever in their life, not being able to focus on the text because you know after five minutes of reading stuff will be uh, difficult and that means that it will require special accommodation you can still take the test we will give you a special accommodation and and that's it uh, other uh, times you know it, it can be just lack of practice simply because nowadays people consume information very much differently they see and hear rather than read Okay, the, the, the most uh, times uh, you read stuff will be like, you know, a Twitter post and you scroll down all the time, you know. And even like with us, British Council, you know, when we make uh, announcements, when we decide in the team, how do we do it? 
And if anybody in the team says, let's make a post about it, our marketing team will be, no, let's make a video about it, <laughs> okay? And that, that's the whole thing. That's how you perceive information. That means that most of you young people will actually not be trained in reading boring and tough text. You know, you open any British newspaper, it will put you into sleep, you know, <laughs> in, in 10 minutes after reading this. And what instead, how, how do I read information, right? I would listen to a podcast. And that's it. And that means that you just have to train for it, unless you have like a special condition and of which you should be aware of. That's that's my point. Uh, question back to you: Do you read a lot in your own first language? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. And do you know how many words you st uh, you read in IELTS uh, reading test? It's up to uh, 2,700. It's like 2,700 words. So uh, each text is around uh, eight, nine hundred, okay? Uh, each text. So this means like if you do not read in your own first language and you are reading uh, text uh, in a foreign language, what are you expecting? And this is an academic text. It's not a popular uh, science, it's an academic one. So you have to be specially trained. So first of all, maybe you start loving reading in your own first language, and then uh, you also uh, develop a habit reading in English, and I'm sure that your reading would be nine points. And Thank you. I want to add one more thing, uh, that as we talked earlier, when uh, here almost everybody mentioned it, uh, you should enjoy it. Like, don't, don't treat that IELTS reading as uh, kind of like text and uh, followed by several questions. Sometimes, you know what, this happens to me that while I'm doing reading with my students or alone, I forget that I'm doing IELTS reading test because uh, the information that I'm getting from the text or like IELTS, those reading passages, uh, they give very interesting information, a very interesting analysis of human behavior or animals' behavior that while I was reading, I got really impressed, wow. And then uh, I keep reading, reading, and try to understand what they are saying instead of answering the question. So when you reach that level of reading or uh, comprehension, then you can get like higher scores. So instead of like improving, uh, instead of thinking how you can improve your score, uh, focus on how you can improve your Comprehension skills. Comprehension means like understanding. So uh, try to understand the text. Try to, uh, like as uh, Barno said, uh, like enjoy it. So that's it. And then uh, you start to score higher, like band scores. Отлично. Тут к нам поступило пару вопросов. И он следующий: Какой период времени является оптимальным для подготовки к экзамену? И есть вторая часть этого вопроса. Что вы можете посоветовать для того, чтобы расширить кругозор для улучшения спикинга и рейтинга? Well, uh, first question about the time for preparation. So uh, we can't really answer this question because uh, we don't know your level. Uh, level of general English. Um, you should have uh, enough level of general English. Really, a colleague told about that you have to learn English, right? If you have a good level of English, uh, preparation for IELTS uh, doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, please. Yeah, just, just to prove uh, his point there. So I had a friend, right, who had really good level of English. Eh? And he watched uh, IELTS preparation video for three hours on YouTube. And guess what his score is? 8.5. Three hours of preparation. Что вам больше всего нравится в своей работе? I work with adults. <laughs> uh, if you visit my Instagram page, uh, at the top I have mentioned that uh, teaching is not my job, teaching is my lifestyle. And when I enter the classroom, uh, I don't uh, enter the classroom with the mindset that I'm going to teach something. I enter the classroom that now I'm going to have a chat 
uh, I'm going to like gossip. I'm going to have kind of daily conversation with uh, some interesting people. Uh, and then the time passes, so the lesson is over in uh, an hour and uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and then that's it. I said, wow, it was a good talk, so bye-bye. So uh, I'll see you in the next gossip, and life goes on. So that's my uh, favorite part of my job. Uh, I, I want to also mention uh, a couple things, but first I want to preface by saying I don't actually feel, or at least in the past, I don't know, maybe half a year, I don't really feel entirely like a teacher teacher because I haven't really been in an offline classroom for a while. I haven't necessarily been like making lesson plans. Uh, for me, what's really interesting is the uh, cross-section of making entertainment and education together. And I feel like that is where we are really moving in a lot of ways because of the fact that, you know, TikTok, YouTube Shorts, attention spans are lower than ever. It's very difficult to just get students to sit in a room and really think about a topic very deeply. Sometimes I even have trouble, like as we mentioned with IELTS reading, you go through the whole text and by the end of the text, you've, you're asleep, you're sleeping, that's it. So uh, I feel like for me, the most enjoyable part of you know, the whole teaching experience and having a Telegram channel uh, is the ability to innovate and create new content and new types of things that students can learn in more engaging ways. So I'd say that's the most interesting thing for me is, is innovation and creation. Можно задам вопрос от себя? Пять-шесть лет назад, когда я сам готовился к Айлсу, таких возможностей, как сейчас, не было. Таких гостевых лекций. Чтобы сдать мог тест нужно было заранее с кем-то договариваться, общаться, просить. Сейчас у них все есть. Но вот исходя из этой перспективы, что вы, успешные, взрослые люди, которые добились многого в жизни, можете посоветовать ребятам в возрасте 15-16 лет для того, чтобы достичь какого-то успеха, который начнется сначала с образования? Надо просто идти. Я oh. думаю так. Вы обязательно придете куда-то, as long as you are walking, as long as you are going. Просто проблема в том, что, например, когда мы достигаем чего-то, мы думаем, что это стоп. А на самом деле, the end of one mountain is just the start of the another mountain. And we always think that once I accomplish this goal, I overcome this struggle, everything is going to end. But the life is all about this ups and downs. And the end of one mountain is the start of the other mountain. You have to shift your perspective and change your mindset and stop thinking that life is easy, honestly. And like the gentleman who's 14 years of age said, he's struggling. But as long as you are trying and as long as you are going, you will get somewhere. And probably one of the biggest secrets in IELTS prep and in learning something is like, you just have to continue and proceed. You have to continue doing something. It's, it's a simple math. You try 10 times, two times work. You try 20 times, four times it works out. And I guarantee all those people those seven people who scored nine band score, they've taken IELTS several times. And they didn't settle. They didn't stop. They tried again and again and again. And the question back to you, why do we stop when something doesn't work out from second time round, from the third time round? Why do we stop? Fear. Yeah, and then where does this fear come from? 90% comes from outside, okay? And then you have to shift your mindset. It's been like more than five years. I agreed with myself. I made a, literally a contract with myself. I said, you are a learner. You're not a teacher. You're a learner. Every single student is my teacher. Every single hardship in my life is my teacher for my growth. I'm a learner. So if you also shift your mindset and you become a lifelong learner, because learning doesn't stop when you get nine. Learning doesn't stop when you get eight. So life has a lot of, a lot of lessons ahead. 
just forget that everything is going to be easy when you overcome one struggle. It's going to stop there. No, it's like computer game. You are at the elementary level, and then you go for the pre-intermediate level. And in life, it's the same. You lose something because you are enhancing. You are elevating. You go to the next level. And then you think that, oh, I will settle. No, life will toss you something more serious than that. And then you have to do that. It's like the computer game. You go higher and higher and higher. And the secret, I believe, is not settling and then going and going and continuing that path. Друзья, к вам вопрос. Что вы хотите вообще от жизни? Представьте, прошло два года, начиная с сегодняшнего дня. Вы сделали всю работу, которая от вас требовалась, чтобы достичь чего-то, чего вы желаете. И просто назовите, чего вы желаете вообще. Жить полной жизнью. Отлично. Что следующее? Деньги, власть, должность, что-то еще. Давайте. Брубеж, кора, с тонировкой. Отлично. Что еще? Что-то еще? Что, что, что? Вау, это очень классно для цели через два года. Блин, мне нравится ваш поинт. Мыслите всегда широко, больше, чем любой другой человек в вашем окружении, потому что именно так и достигается успех. Позвольте себе думать больше, чем думает среднестатистический человек. Отлично. Что дальше? Лайфстайл, который вы хотите. Отлично. Что еще? Друзья, вот вы назвали все эти факторы. Как много людей вы знаете, возможно, не в вашем окружении, кто уже этого достиг? Они есть. Сто процентов. Есть человек, который занимается ресерчами в медицине. Очень много людей, у кого черная джентра, правильно? Очень много людей, кто зарабатывает шестизначные числа в долларах, евро, во всем что угодно. Очень много людей, у кого есть малибу, правильно? Что еще вы назвали? Лайфстайл, который мы хотим. Миллионы людей, которые живут лайфстайлом, который вы хотите. И все, что я хочу сказать. Вы ничем не меньше, ничем не хуже этих людей, а вы даже лучше, потому что у вас есть время, у вас есть возможность заниматься тем делом, которое в дальнейшем принесет вас к успеху. И все, что вам нужно, это просто делать следующий шаг. Да, вам страшно, да, вы чувствуете, что вы не уверены, вот как сказала мисс Барно. Все, что нужно, это сделать следующий шаг. И поверьте мне, исходя из своего двухлетнего опыта в Интернейшн, каждый студент, который здесь учится, он делает все, что нужно для того, чтобы достичь успеха. И поэтому сейчас похлопайте себе, потому что вы большие молодцы и делаете все, что нужно для этого. А сейчас, так как у нас осталось мало времени, мы закончим с вопросами, и мы подготовили небольшое задание для наших гостей, о которых мы им не сказали. Так, как думаете, что за задание мы приготовили? Было похожее в прошлый раз, два месяца назад, когда мы также на дружбе собрались. А сейчас мы попросим написать план успешного успеха, состоящий из 10 шагов, для того, чтобы потом его представить вам. А дорогие гости, попросим вас встать, написать план. My personal role model is Warren Buffett and uh, his partner Charlie Munger. Uh, and I think that uh, for a lot of young people, you know, reading up on those two would definitely add a lot of value to, to your life early on. And uh, one of the first things they, they always say uh, about success and stuff, and no one can argue that they are not successful people, they are extremely successful people. Uh, is following your dream, and I fully agree. Of course, nowadays, uh, things change uh, very quickly. New things uh, come up every now and then. And uh, there are very high chances that throughout your career, you may have to retrain more than once, as uh, the, the uh, trades and professions that uh, appear nowadays did not exist just 10, 10 years ago, you know. But still, following your dream and being non-conformist, you know, being uh, not something that everyone expects is extremely important, you know, being yourself, knowing what you desire and following that dream. And then maintaining your reputation is extremely important. What I'm trying to say is that uh, ma maintain your good reputation, you know, because uh, nothing really takes uh, so much time as to build good reputation, 
making sure that uh, people know you as a decent person, reliable, and, and overall a good person. And then ruining that reputation takes just one thing, you know. And uh, in the words of Warren Buffett, basically, uh, don't do stuff that uh, you wouldn't want to see on the first page of your local newspaper, okay, the next day. And, and that will pretty much make sure that you are on the right path, okay? Yeah, I will continue with the next one. So that's keep learning. Uh, in all these points, it's really important that you keep, lean, keep learning. Uh, it's not only here, it's uh, at all stages of your life, you have to uh, keep learning if you want to keep updated these days because uh, development is going so fast that if you stop learning, uh, I don't know what happens. Next one is mentorship. Yes, uh, in the process of learning, mentorship is always important. You need somebody to get advice. You need somebody who can guide you. So uh, again, in all of these points, uh, mentorship uh, is really important. Uh, somebody uh, always uh, should be there kind of giving you advice or at least guiding you. There is always, uh, you have a question you want to ask, right? And you ask somebody if that would be a, a mentor, your mentor, okay? Uh, I wrote the next two points and I wanna tell you about the second one first which is actually very related to mentorship, and that is networking with your peers. That, that's, that's number seven, right? right? I'm, okay. I'm bad at mathematics, sorry. Um, so other than people that are above you, I think it's also very important to look horizontally at the people that are around you, right? I mean, literally, right now, look at the people around you. You're all in the same environment, in the same place, and you have relatively similar goals. One of the most important things that you can do is understand that that is power. Being able to see life through the same position but through a different set of eyes is a very, very powerful thing. And the, the last thing that I want to mention myself is visualize your success. Regardless of what kind of journey you're on, whether you are learning IELTS, whether you're trying to become an Olympic swimmer, whatever kind of thing you're trying to do, the, the goals that you have at the beginning are not necessarily the goals that you will have at the end. I think this is kind of some practical advice. You don't always have to hold yourself to the same exact standard that you were from the very beginning. It can be unhealthy. So uh, I would say that one of the biggest steps to success is in the middle of your journey, analyze. What have you done so far and where are you really going to go? I think those are my steps. Uh, number five is mine, enjoy the moment. Uh, I don't know others, but I believe in destiny, and everything. Our destiny is written. So whatever we do, uh, like we can change our life by only uh, making choices, uh, not doing something. So uh, that's why, uh, and life is short. Uh, so that's why uh, we need to enjoy. Like you should, you should be able to enjoy the moment. Whatever you are doing, just enjoy it and uh, get and like do it enthusiastically so that you end up being happy uh, after doing a task. I guess next one is mine. Know exactly what you want. And a lot of stuff that Alex said resonate with my vision of life. And one caveat over there, know exactly what you want. And I need to make a little disclaimer and clarify on that point is know exactly what you want for the time being. And I do believe that dreams change, goals change, because you change too. And speaking scientifically and biologically, your human body, your body changes like 100% in over the course of seven years. You can change your DNA. And then why do you believe that you have to stay 100% loyal for your entire life for one goal? When you change, your goals change. When you change, your dreams change. When you change, your job changes because you are a totally different person. And then if you do this testing, biological testing, so your human body entirely, it sheds all the skin over the course of seven years and you become a totally different person. And then whoever tells you, you have to have only one dream for your entire life, they are BSing because it's not correct. Because times change, people change, and what differentiates 
I believe dream from the goal is like when you are goal oriented, you have a, an action plan. You know what you want to do. You have principles. You have step-by-step -step guidance. And, but when you dream, you just daydream. And then you probably write nightman score and then hang it on your ceiling. And then you look at that nightman. And then the universe may actually misinterpret nine to six. And then don't be sad if you end up getting not nine but six. Because from above, probably nine is usually seen like six score. So I am for proactive actions. So don't dream, set goals, and make sure that goals change because you change biologically, your DNA changes, your dreams change. And the last one also belongs to me, take small yet consistent steps. Again, a little uh, personal anecdote. Every time I'm scared going after a big and grandiose dreams of mine, I say to myself, Barno, just one step, one step per time. And when I take one step, I'm not that much scared. And the next time, I say like, okay, Marno, one more step, okay? One more step. That's how I hack my fear, my limiting beliefs. And feel free, use it. One step per time, concentrate on a single step. As long as you're going, you're gonna go and you're gonna get to the destination, okay? Thank you. And point number nine was mine. Ignore the naysayers. There are lots of people. Eh? Lots of people. It can be your neighbor, your relatives, eh? sometimes even your parents, eh? who say that you cannot do it. it. It would seem like impossible for them, right? So they say those things because they cannot do it themselves, right? Usually, like losers eh? want to discourage other people, right? So therefore, my advice would be just ignore them, right? Uh, the perfect book, the perfect like bestseller book for you to read on like ignoring the naysayers would be a subtle art of not giving a right. Yeah, yeah, three dots. <laughs> All right, that that's a really good book. Thank you. Mr. Alex, Mr. Dishot, Mr. Andrei. Еще раз большое спасибо, что пришли. Надеемся видеть вас в стенах нашего учебного центра еще много раз, потому что с такими людьми, как вы, нам безумно нравится кооперировать. И я уверен, что эта встреча сегодня принесла очень много полезного для наших студентов. Спасибо еще раз. Thanks everyone for inviting us. It's been a great pleasure meeting you all. And just the last, uh, the last thing, please check out our website. You'll find plenty of free resources there to help you prepare for your IELTS exam. Okay.